Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Sorry I was not here with you uh, yesterday. I'm teaching. I was teaching yesterday in Chicago and, and flew out last night. Uh, but it's great to be here with this program and look forward to your comments. Look forward to uh, uh, Scott's comments. Thanks in advance for your very kind comments about my paper, I'm sure. OK, so uh, this is work with uh, Pierre Azoulay, uh, Danny Kim, uh, and Javier Miranda at Census. I am required to say at the opening that any opinions and conclusions expressed herein are those of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the US Census. All results have been reviewed to ensure that no confidential information is disclosed. Um, OK, so this is a paper I've wanted to write for a long time, uh, but haven't had the data. Uh, and this is uh, there was an advance in the data capacity infrastructure that allowed us to do this. Um, and the question uh, we wanted to ask is, <clears throat> when in life uh, do people start uh, the most successful firms? Not when they start businesses, because we're really interested in this particular paper. Well, that's interesting it, as well. We're interested in sort of the higher growth businesses, the kind of entrepreneurship that might underlie creative destruction in the economy and be uh, a potentially very important part of uh, economic growth. Uh, so to set up the hypotheses, on the left we have Steve Jobs. Now, when he, around the age, he started Apple Computer. He was very young, in his early 20s. Um, very famous case, right? And of course, many people believe that very young people are the source of the really transformative firms. Um, on the right, maybe a bit lesser known, is David Duffield. <clears throat> David Duffield was the founder of PeopleSoft, and then later, at age 64, uh, he founded Workday, uh, not that long ago, about 12 years ago. Uh, and Workday today, again, he founded it at age 64, has a market capitalization of around $35 billion. Okay, so it took it to IPO pretty quickly. That's a business-to-business -business, uh, human resources software uh, firm. Okay, so you know, we, we, see, we do see entrepreneurship from much older people as well. That seems to be high growth. Um, now, kind of, this paper is you know, originally written and motivated by a null hypothesis, that is that perception publicly uh, that young people are, are often uh, the source of great ideas. So uh, Mark Zuckerberg once said, young people are just smarter. Uh, now, he, he did later take that back, but he did say it. Uh, it stuck out there for a while. Uh, but that's kind of a view. You know, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, no, it's something I will, a, a good insight. We'll come back to that. Uh, uh, Paul Graham, who's a you know, founder of Y Combinator, think of him as kind of an entrepreneur, kind of Bay Area thinker. Um, the cutoff in investors' heads is 32. After 32, they start to be a little skeptical. Right? And so there's this whole kind of culture, often, but associated with Silicon Valley emphasizing youth and sort of young people uh, as sort of driving technological change and really the, the, the font of, of big new ideas. Um, you know, so that's just a couple of quotes. You can find others, um, many others. Um, in terms of perceptions, uh, so on the left, we're taking sort of tech, tech crunch awards, which, are, which were, are given to sort of the big new firms and new ideas. Uh, the average age of the founders uh, when uh, they award these awards is 31. Uh, if you look at sort of entrepreneurs to watch kind of lists from Inc. and Entrepreneur Magazines, the average age of the people they highlight is 29. Um, VCs are a little bit older that, than that, sort of you know, Sequoia, uh, Matrix Partners, you know, 33 to 37, say, um, you know, young, kind of middle, middle 30s uh, there as well. Okay, so this all suggests that, again, young people might be the source of the great ideas. All right, so is any of that true? Um, we'll get there in a second. Um, what's going on uh, underneath this view? Um, one idea is that somehow young people are sort of more capable of transformative thinking. They're not beholden to some particular paradigm of thought, so they're kind of able to come up with more uh, creative or earth-shattering ideas. Uh, that's an idea in creativity. It's an idea uh, in science. It's an idea that seems to be part of what's going on in, how, in entrepreneurship, uh, how people have these views. Um, another idea is deductive reasoning. That would be go with Mark Zuckerberg's They're Just Smarter, and people are just smarter quote. Uh, but this is the idea that you know, chess players or mathematicians might be especially good when they're young, and there's something about sort of a certain kind of deductive uh, reasoning that might be uh, privileged among younger people. And the third might be more energy and time, just the idea that young people are uh, unencumbered with family responsibilities, uh, mortgages, tuitions, et cetera. They, they uh, might play into risk as well, but they, they sort of can, you know, think of the person who's able to work 100 hours a week and eat pizza every night for dinner. 
and that's something young people do, and it's harder to do as you as you get older. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you look at a lot of standard research in, in economics about and with theoretically or or empirically, uh, it tends to emphasize that you know key re resources may accumulate with age, right? Either you kind of get better human capital through experience and uh, maybe formal technical skill, uh, you have more access to financial capital personally, and maybe more access to financial capital leverages your access to external capital, uh, and maybe social capital. You just have better networks in industries. Uh, you better understand problems. All right, so you could, you could tell the story very, very, very differently. Um, all right. What is existing evidence, briefly? Well, we, we know that in some samples uh, among general entrepreneurs, and there's sort of, you could look in many papers to find this kind of a thing, you know, maybe late 30s, early 40s. Um, but that's sort of general entrepreneurship, right? And, and is when people start firms. And most, most entrepreneurs are, you know, restaurants, mom and pop retail. Um, not um, the kind of high growth uh, entrepreneurship that, again, we might think is important to uh, creative destruction. If you look more at tech entrepreneurship, sort of growth-oriented entrepreneurship, then you just get into sort of conflicts in the, in, the, in the evidence. And it's because I think these are, there are lots of different selected samples that are being used. Uh, Wadwood all have a telephone survey, um, which said, you know, this is of tech firms. Uh, I got 500 firms, but, you know, the response rate isn't that high. Uh, and these are pretty successful. They have at least one million in sales. There, the average founder age is 39. Okay, so it's a bit older. Uh, Frick looked at you know sort of VC-backed unicorns, uh, so you know firms that people are giving very high valuations to anyway uh, with VC backing. And they found the mean. He found the mean age is 31. It's quite a bit lower. Um, this paper uh, looked at LinkedIn profiles and angels list, and they found that the peak founder age is actually only five years after the bachelor's degree. So that would be like you know 28, maybe 27. Um, and, and, you know, this paper is going to say it's actually 17 years or something after the bachelor's degree. So, so these are very, very different answers. Uh, and you could imagine, you know, that LinkedIn profiles might select on a certain, certain set of tech-oriented young people and maybe older. David Duffield, I don't know if he's on LinkedIn, uh, but might, might not appear in that, kind of a, in that kind of a sample. Okay, so there we have it. What am I doing here? Well, I think I'm here because the answer is going to be kind of interesting. In fact, I've been giving this uh, paper in various places, but I've also been giving it to... Uh, alums and sort of Kel at Kellogg at the business school where I teach. And uh, they're always really excited when the talk is over. So <laughs> it's a very optimistic, optimistic talk. I've also given it to my current students, which is a little trickier uh, because they tend to be in their late 20s. But OK, so where, where, where are we going to go? All right, so how are we going to do this? So the idea here is to try to get as, as an administrative data set of all the startups, at least where we can. No, nothing's perfect. Um, what we're able to do is you know, take the LBD from the US Census, which of course gives us information about every firm with an, at least one employee in the country, um, and then can chart their sales and their growth and whether they get acquired and whether they have an IPO because it links to CompuStat. So that's kind of a lot of resources there. We're able to link it to K1 business owners data, which is an innovation in, in the, at the Census Bureau. This is new IRS data that tells you, at least for pass-through entities, who owns what. Okay, So you can actually begin to... Uh, see who owns many of these businesses, at least if they're uh, S-corps or um, partnerships. So that gives us sort of a big step forward for large numbers of firms. Uh, we then, of course, inherit the US Census demographic files, so we know how old everybody is, all the employees, but also these business owners. So we can begin to see how old you are when you founded the firm. And then we also have W-2 records data. Uh, and we're going to work with sort of two different definitions of founder. One is basically an owner worker, so you own the firm and you work there. Uh, and another definition is just founding team. You're one of the top three paid employees in the year that the firm starts. Okay, so they're sort of conceptually distinct, and maybe both are useful in terms of thinking about the human capital that could drive success uh, in the firm. Um, you know, among other innovations in the census, we're also able to bring in this new longitudinal linked patent business database, which takes all of the patents in the U.S. and links them to firms and inventors. So we can see uh, in the census. So we can see which firms have patents. We get one, way, one way of getting at tech. Uh, and we also link in venture capital databases by ex venture expert and PCRI. So we, this is not, not quite perfect, I mean, but, but the best we can, we can see which firms have venture capital backing. All right? Okay. So we then generate three diff uh, two different sort of themes in thinking about growth orientation. One is an ex-ante theme, which is, uh, you know, sort of around the time it starts, or is there, is there something tech about the firm? But we don't know if it's going to say it actually succeeded, but just is it tech-oriented? So high tech industry means it's in, an, it's in an industry, a narrow industry code, which has lots of STEM workers. Patenting firm means the firm has a patent. VC-backed firm means the firm has venture capital. 
These are not necessarily ex ante because you know maybe you get venture capital later, but it's sort of suggestive of some kind of growth orientation, more in an ex ante sense. Ex post, and I think most powerfully, which I'll emphasize, is that we actually see whether these firms grow because we can track for every firm its employees and its sales. Okay. We also see for every firm if it is has an IPO and also if it is acquired, say, while it's growing. So kind of a positive growth acquisition, so exit and some successful exit. So I'm going to successful exit as one of our outcomes. All right. All right. So here we go. All firms started from 2007 to 2014. If you just look at every firm, you get 41.9. Okay, so this is actually quite consistent with those other studies that says something like that. But again, this is going to be, mo by the vast majority of this, is going to be uh, restaurants and you know, other things that aren't sort of growth oriented. Okay? So we, now, what if we try to focus in uh, on growth orientation? If you use our ex ante sort of type uh, measures, the age just goes up. Right, so high-tech employment sectors, VC-backed firms, and patenting firms. VC are a bit younger, say maybe uh, somewhat three years younger than patenting. But when you add in sort of these kind of tech characteristics, actually the founders don't, don't shift into the 20s. They don't shift into even to the 30s. They actually get older, okay, uh, interestingly. If you do this by sector and you look kind of at the, you can do it by NAICS codes and say, what about the, maybe some sectors like computing, it's like 20s and then others are much older. Actually, the, the, well, it depends what you think. I mean, maybe you have different null hypothesis. But the youngest you're going to get, which would be in sort of telecom and in software, uh, is actually founding ages around 39 to 40. So you're still not going to see 35, 30, 25. Okay? And then you're going to see some, some areas like, it turns out, like oil and gas. Uh, entrepreneurs are like 51 on average. Okay. Um, all right, on the upper end. All right, now, what about ex post? So what about based on growth? Now, the nice thing about the census data is that we have all these firms. We have lots of firms. So we can start looking at very, very upper tail outcomes. We can look at the upper 10% in terms of growth outcome, upper 5%, upper 1%, and we're going to look at the upper 0.1%, so the 1 in 1,000 highest growth firms after, well, I'm going to emphasize five years here, but you can do it by three years. Uh, you get very similar results, or seven years even. And then we'll also look at uh, successful exits. All right, so here's what that looks like. 41, so forward think of these kind of 41 to 42. And then as you go to higher and higher growth successes, the age actually goes up. So the top 0.1% in, in, in the successful exits, 45, 46.7. Okay, so a main finding is that actually the highest growth firm, this is not when you exit or, or when you have success, this is when you found the firm. So in the year of founding, the average founder age of the highest growth firms is actually 45. Again, so it's way, I, I might have thought, I might have, this was surprising to me at least, I don't know what you guys, with, what your nulls were, but I would have thought, I was kind of, I'd, I'd have been surprised if it was in the 20s, but I might have thought 30s or something given sort of the zeitgeist on this thing, and this seems very, very different. Okay. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I mean, we'd have, I'd have, that's a good question. I, I don't know that number offhand, but I can tell you that this is something like having a thousand employees after five years. Upper tail, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, um, thank you. Um, okay, one other thing I want to say that actually, in this we, we can cut this by our geography too. It's the beauty of administrative data. So we can look at Silicon Valley. We can look at California as a whole, we can look at New York, Boston. You're just not going to, when you cut it that way, you're just not going to see a different answer. Okay? And from building on Scott and Jorge Guzman's work, we can look at the zip codes in the US that are the most entrepreneurial in a growth oriented sense using their techniques. Just take the very narrow zip codes that are the most growth oriented, same answer. Okay? Um, so it's, it's, it's geographically broad in that sense. All right, now, oh, I should, I should preview this one. Okay, now what's going on here is, you know, it's in the late 40s, mid, mid, mid 40s, say. But of course, most startups are coming from people in the mid-40s. So, so part of the issue is that, you know, it might still be that 20-somethings have a very high probability of success, maybe 22-year-olds, 24-year-olds, because what we're looking at here is, is where, the, where the high growth companies are coming from. But most of the swings at the bat are coming from 40-year-olds. 40, 40 so not surprisingly, most of the home runs are coming from 40-year-olds. Does that make sense? So, so we want to look not just at sort of where the meat of the high growth firms come from, which is very interesting, I think, but also to look at conditional on trying. So conditional on going into the batter's box and swinging the bat, what's your probability of a home run? Now, of course, this is going to be right skewed. It's 45 here and 41 there, so it suggests it's going to be older again. But here's a very different picture, because this says, that says it's all about middle age, right, 45. Right? Here's the picture where you look at conditional on starting a firm. 
So this is the probability of getting to that upper, upper tail growth relative to 20-year-old. And this is successful exit relative to 20-year-old. And this is age. Okay? So interestingly, you know, it's, it's a little noisy, but it just kind of goes up with age. Right? So actually, like, you know, a 60-year-old, say over there, or kind of 60, you know, 50, 45 to 60, 45 to 64, is systematically way higher in your probability of having an upper tail growth outcome than people down in their 20s. Like dramatically, you're more than double the actual baseline rate. All right? So that's kind of interesting. This is my 60 is the new 20 graph. OK. And so that's, this is why it's an optimistic picture. See, I told you the optimistic talk, you know? Uh, so, right, so it, you know, it's completely, and this, this is very striking compared to the sort of zeitgeist. Now, of course, why are people starting? Is it that they know it only to start when they've got a really good idea and their fools rush in at young ages or something like that? So, it's a little, you know, there's, interp interpreters are open, but for some reason, you know, conditional, if I, were, if I were a conditional, someone comes to me and says, I'm starting a firm and I wanted to predict who was going to be the most successful, I should go for the 60 year old, not the 20 year old. And I'd be, I'd be like much higher likelihood, conditional them coming to me and saying they're starting a firm. All right. Um, OK, so now we're looking at the upper 0.1% in growth. So okay, that's it. That's, um, that's uh, unusual firms, right? Unusually, uh, very unusually successful firms. But we still have a puzzle that, of course, there are extremely successful, very young entrepreneurs. There's Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Sergey Brin and Larry Page with Google, who are you know graduate students here, so they're kind of late 20s when they started. But you know, Gates, Zuckerberg, Jobs are early 20s, right? Uh, very early 20s, and then. Um, you know, Bezos, the Amazon, he's 30. Okay, so he's, he's still not, he's not 45, he's, he's younger, right? So how do we reconcile like that, okay? And because it could be that, you know, we're looking in the upper tail, but there's an upper, upper tail, we can, you know, even though we, have, we can't get to the very, very upper tail, maybe it would reverse, and then suddenly 22-year-olds are really, really powerful in the super upper tail. Um, so the way I've been trying to think about this, uh, with some evidence I'll show you in a second, and try to reconcile that, is, okay, well, let's take Steve Jobs. So there's Steve Jobs. There's two versions of Steve Jobs. There's 23-year-old Steve Jobs, and there's 51, all right? If you actually think about Apple and Steve Jobs' trajectory, right, you know, obviously very successful early in some sort of general absolute sense, but nowhere near as successful as it was later. Right? He actually left the company, right, and then he kind of went to Next, and then he came back, right? It's actually the iPhone and that, and that sequence of things that he's introduced when he's 51, which is what took Apple to the, you know, top market, market cap in the world, right? So... So actually, if you look at Steve Jobs, what you could say is that he was really good when he was young, but he might have even been even better, right? He even learned something. He learned to have like an open platform and network externalities and, and econ speak, right? He learned not to have everything be so closed, um, yet held on to his kind of consumer problem solving, high quality product orientation. Anyway, so you can tell stories where he kind of accumulated wisdom himself. Now, you could generalize that. How would you generalize that? And again, these are just four observations, but they're four important observations, so they're kind of interesting. Um, so our idea was, well, let's look at these companies started by these very, very young founders, the most famous companies, famous founders, and look at their, once they go public, look at their forward stock price multiple. Sort of what, when is their growth in the market cap of Apple or Amazon or Microsoft or Google highest, looking forward five years, right, from any moment in time? Because, of course, any firm is a series of innovations. These entrepreneurs don't, like, have one idea and then stop. They have a series of ideas, right? And if you look at that, You'll see, you know, so Steve Jobs and Apple actually, you know, 48, looking forward five years, is by far the kind of peak growth of Apple's uh, uh, market value. Uh, Gates, it's actually 39, Bill Gates. Jeff Bezos is like 44. Okay, so, you know, books are good, but then, like, you know, it's obviously a lot more than books. And there's a lot of other innovations going on. Google, it's, you know, we have short series, but these guys, these guys are still young, early 40s, but the peak we'd see so far in this relatively short series is more like 30, um, 36, I think, okay? So in other words, if you think about the idea that young people are supposed to be better, that's actually a within-person comment, like to, to, and to Richard's point about Mark Zuckerberg. It's the point that like somehow we were, all, we were all better and then we got worse. That's what you're basically saying, right? But a different perspective would be that some people have inc you know, more or less innate entrepreneurial talent. That's kind of a fixed effect and like, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs have very high fixed effects, right? But conditional on your fixed effect, people sort of get better with age, right? And even these guys do, at least by this kind of a measure. So I think that's how in my head I've been sort of reconciling the presence of very young, stellar entrepreneurs with kind of this, in the administrative data, very strong aging pattern. Uh, and then, you know, you look at these guys and maybe it looks fairly similar. 
All right. Uh, two, I have until, I have five more minutes, right? Okay, so a uh, um, couple last points. So, you know, we don't, we really set this paper up about that null hypothesis because it's such a strong view that it's all about young people. Of course, once you find that it's not about young people, um, it suggests that, you know, it may be true that, you know, the transformative thinking or deductive reasoning or, you know, energy and time, they may be advantages of young people. But if that's true on net, you know, something else is happening over the life cycle, which suggests that those are being overcome on net by something else. And, you know, what would that be? Well, that goes to some more standard human capital, financial capital, social capital kind of reasoning. Uh, and while we don't in this paper sort of really try to unpack that, we're kind of about rejecting the null, we begin to, you know, on, on a couple of dimensions. And, and, and one of them is you can look at, because you know, again, the census data, you can look where every individual was employed, their series of employment going back a reasonable amount of time. So you can see if they're coming from within the industry or outside the industry. Okay. And we do this at various levels of, of industry specificity using, using NAICS codes. But here I'm going to show you the most specific, NAICS 6. So this is a six-digit NAICS code. There's over a thousand of these sectors in the US, U.S. economy. A very, very high share, not quite the majority, but many entrepreneurs start firms in exactly the same NAICS 6 code that they have worked in prior. Okay? And then this says, all right, well, what's your chance of having one of these upper tail outcomes if you've never worked in the same, so this is, take the NAICS 6 code of the startup, if you've never worked in that code, if you've worked there briefly or you've worked there for a while, okay? And, you know, just to kind of go over here, looking at these upper, super upper tail, I think we care the most, you know, basically, if you've, if you've worked in it, especially if you've worked in it for a while, you're going to over double your chance of um, a home run. So somehow now industry experience is actually su seems like super relevant to predicting success. Um, the... Other thing that you could see, if I did NAICS 4 versus NAICS 2, basically this number, 0.26, it's higher for NAICS 6 than it is for NAICS 4, and it's higher for NAICS 4 than it is for NAICS 2. So sort of the closer you are and the longer you've been there seems to have a, have a detectable advantage and a pretty substantial advantage in your capacity to hit a home run. So this, again, this seems kind of contrary to the transformative thinking when you people from outside the, outside the industry, outside the box, experience is bad, 20-year-olds are kind of unencumbered by experience. You know, at least for up even to the, uh, the 0.1%, you know, actually experience looks quite useful uh, on average in predicting upper tail success. And another interesting thing is, you know, what is accumulating? Well, again, we don't try to really unpack that in the paper. General financial resources that could be accumulating with life wouldn't necessarily apply in this way, right? So, so that may be true. It may be an important part of the advantage of age is financial resources. But this suggests, because it's so specific to the, so specific to the industry, that there's something about industry-specific human capital or social, and or social capital that seemed pretty important. So it helps you think a little bit about what's going on. Um, last sort of discussion comment, um, resource allocation. So stepping back from a more policy point of view, and of course we should be very hesitant about policy uh, prescriptions. I just want to raise questions here, not make prescriptions. But um, so to raise one question, you know, if resources, if, if, if resources, both because entrepreneurs try, you know, think they're going to be better and because VC is targeted that way, go to the young, are we missing out on, are we not just having sort of less success maybe, but are we biasing towards certain kinds of innovation? You know, young people, everyone tries to innovate around problems they understand, right? And the problems of young people are not necessarily the problems of society. And so, you know, the digital, the digitorati or whatever, the young, the millennials. You know, Peter Thiel, interestingly, he says, you know, we rather famously, we wanted flying cars, instead we got 140 characters. You know, maybe because a lot of things like this are really hard and you kind of want a lot of technical expertise. At the same time, Peter Thiel, you know, funds, he's a scholar who are funded to drop out of college and try to be Mark Zuckerberg, basically. So he kind of, on the one hand, is like, well, we shouldn't. He sort of se seems to think that you can sort of do this without any knowledge uh, coming from outside the industry. And yet, you know, he also has this puzzle. So I think there's a bit of a contradiction, potentially, in this perspective and his perspective. Um, what are VCs doing? It's really interesting because, you know, they are betting younger. I didn't really emphasize that. They're not betting that much younger, as far as we can tell. But they're betting maybe three, four years younger uh, than where the success is. Um, so one version of that is that they believe this young meth thing. And they're just themselves kind of behaviorally biased into doing something that is incorrect. Um, but a different view is actually, no, maybe they, maybe they know exactly what they're doing. It's just that young people make for better financial bargains because they don't have, you know, you can basically extract more value. Conditional on whatever the growth of the firm is, the VC gets a larger share from the unsavvy young person. And we know famous stories of that than from a 45 or 50-year-old person who's not going to take external financing unless it's like, it makes sense. They're kind of the judgment to, you know, to bootstrap it or, or, to, or to do something else for their financing. So that's an interesting question. Like, what are VCs doing? But certainly we think about a lot of early stage capital being allocated through this process, and it looks younger than where you think sort of the data seems to suggest the highest growth is. So that does seem uh, worth further exploration. All right, so to summarize, 
Um, you know, the mean age for founders of the most successful firms is actually 45. So our little Dropbox folder for this project became called Age 45. That's the that's what the, in, in the internal team. That's what it's called. The um, but interestingly, I mean, sort of more than that, this figure conditional on starting a firm, swinging the bat, the probability of success. Uh, extreme success is peaking much, you know, beyond 45, actually up to like 64. I mean, you're kind of in this kind of rise or maybe plateau. So, you know, David Duffield, 64 at work day, he's kind of seemingly in the sweet spot. That's the 60 is the new 20 point. And then this seems contrary to common public perceptions and tension with VC behavior. It suggests that older people might have a lot of wisdom and success uh, in entrepreneurship. Uh, as I've alluded to, more work ahead, of course, to unpack this age advantage of success. This is really a very simple paper, right? It's just sort of What's, what, what kind of a fact can we establish when you get administrative data, uh, rejecting the null hypothesis? Uh, but of course, it inspires, hopefully, other work that we want to undertake, and maybe other, others will um, as well. Uh, thanks very much. So thank you, Ben, and thank you, John, and all for um, giving me the opportunity to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, so. Let me first just say that, um, and I probably should be lower or else because I talk really loud. Um, so let me just say that the question that this paper asks is surely important in the sense that we both are interested in where high growth firms come from and we're interested in what motivates people to become entrepreneurs in the first place. And there is a common belief with action behind it that the, all this activity is centered in the young. And if that's not true, that's a big challenge for a whole bunch of different initiatives and even how you think. And I think this conference in particular, um, I think it's going to be particularly important because as I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later, the kinds of things that you think that an entrepreneur needs if they're becoming an entrepreneur at age 45 is very different than the logic of what an entrepreneur quote unquote needs if they're becoming an entrepreneur at age 22. Okay, so let me just kind of first set up what I think is the basic tension of the paper. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. These are two World War I ambulance drivers who actually knew each other during World War I. Neither of them is Ernest Hemingway nor John DePassos, right? One of them, this guy, left there and immediately basically within six months after his demobilization from World War I, became an entrepreneur. And he opened up the Walt Disney Cartoonist in Kansas City, Missouri. That was not a particularly successful venture, but he then very quickly moved to California, and he did a bunch of things and created Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, where his financier and partner totally screwed him over by stealing Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, but good for so this entrepreneur, he came up with this guy and sound cartoons, and then we all know Mickey Mouse. So just to be clear, Walt Disney, one of the most iconic entrepreneurs and creators of the 20th century by any standard, became an entrepreneur at age 21 and was globally famous by age 30. The other person he knew, who was also an ambulance driver with an almost identical demographic and socioeconomic background, was this was, was, uh, was that guy who then came back to the United States, played piano for a while, then he went down to Florida and he sold for about five or 10 years. He sold Swampland for a while, but that didn't work out. But he wasn't like an entrepreneur. He was working for somebody else. Then he got his really lucky break, which he got his, um, to be a salesperson in the paper cup industry. And that was really good industry experience. Because if you know about paper cups, you're interested in what people put in paper cups. So then he got a really good job where he sold the mixes. And then he went to all the different places around the United States. And he actually saw all these people who were making shakes. And he knew that there was one shop out in California that was selling more shakes than any place else. And that place was McDonald's. He literally, at age 55 or 54, basically then just literally approaches the McDonald's brothers. There's a great movie with Michael Keaton that sort of gives a fairly reasonable accounting of this whole process. And then he brings it back to, um, uh, to, to Chicago. And that's Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc did not open a firm until his 40s right down the center of Ben's estimates and did not achieve global success until his mid-50s. Okay, So 
those are two different views of the entrepreneurial process. One is kind of singular vision, the other accumulated experience. Okay, so what do these authors do? I, should, I didn't get a look at this. I, I forgot Javi, sorry about that, okay? But Ben, I knew Ben was gonna provide an enormously clear presentation in addition to a great paper, but just to be clear, the kind of amount of pure administrative work of linking each of these data sets in a very careful way. Um, you know, Danny Kim, who's on this paper, who's a doctoral student of mine, you know, I think is just a real accomplishment just of kind of what is the power of looking at extreme outcomes in the economy with these administrative data sets. So that is an enormous um, benefit. The whole paper is three charts. The mean founder age is 41. That's fantastic. It's, but it gets better because the probability of success conditional on age is increasing in age. And then finally, this kind of whole disruption, you're coming outside the industry, it's just not true. And if you kind of, I, I think if I just had those three charts, that's the essence of the paper. Okay. I have one modest critique of the paper, which I'll do more with Ben offline, which I do worry a little bit, just the nature of their data set is they're looking at foundings, but they're not really looking at first foundings, right? So both McDonald's, you know, Ray Kroc and Walt Disney actually had a failure before, right? And even, you know, look at Reed Hastings, we'll tell you, say Reed Hastings is a kind of mid-age founder by the time he gets to Netflix in his mid-30s, but he's already been through like three ventures. You know what I'm saying? So I, I just worry a little bit that I think the question people ask when we, you know, kind of in startup land is something about when do they become an entrepreneur? And then they kind of say, oh, I might be along with the ride for that person through their ultimate success at age 30. And particularly in this environment, in these zip codes around here, where people are enormously tolerant of good ideas gone bad and then refunding the person to sort of get it right. And there are a few good examples of that and some nice work in the management literature that speaks to that process. Um, but that having been said, Ben and collaborators here, I think have done an enormous public service. These are highly prominent people. I can guarantee you that between Peter Thiel, Paul Graham, and Vinod Kosla, those three people have many more Twitter followers than everybody else in this room, by a lot, okay? Um, they do do programs, both Y Combinator, the Keel Fellowship, Coastless Fund, prioritize the young directly. So real assets of significant resources are being devoted with this investment thesis in mind. And it's just all wrong on average in terms of exactly the outcomes that these founders claim to be interested in, which is high impact businesses that have a successful exit. I mean, that's really striking. It's not just these are growing uh, retail shops, right? Okay. So I think as a, re, as a sort of a comment on the public process, I think we could say, um, as, as a comment on the public debate, there's an enormous value to sort of saying straight down the line, this is, these are the facts, make of them what you will, and kind of thinking about that carefully. I think there's a broader question as to why in economics and in entrepreneurship and innovation we might care about these questions. So let me give you kind of a few different perspectives. And I think Ben, in his discussion, I think more than in the paper, sort of commented on a few of these, but I think they're important. So the first, right, is I do think that there's kind of alternative, I, there, there are clearly alternative implicit models of what's going on when you say we prioritize the young versus prioritize the old. And it's something like the distinction between genius and wisdom, right? You sort of have some notion, but it, what's interesting is I couldn't really map this well to classical ideas in the economics literature, even though they're kind of implicitly ideas that people talk about. So like, what's our model that we have in the back of our head about what sort of Fixed effect of the individual is so important that allows, whether or not it's a Steve Jobs or a Walt Disney, to have that vision that by the time they sort of vaguely graduate high school, not with any particular success, are able to transform an industry. I'll come back to that. Versus why is it that working in the shake shop, or the, with, the, with this, I mean, not the shake shop, the, 
with the, you know, selling the shake, shake mixers turns out to be so important for McDonald's success. And let me be clear, not a trivial portion of it, you know, and, and, and Ray Kroc was extremely clear about this in both his biography, was that his knowledge was the McDonald brothers knew they were good, but because he had visited every restaurant in the United States pretty much, he knew they were best. And that was really important for saying that you could just port that model and he could win in every single market. I mean, there's a little bit more to it, but, but that was a real insight. Um, so that's experience, okay? And so what's the nature of entrepreneurial learning? And I, once again, I don't think there's a good formal model that I'm aware of. I was a little bit late today because I was really struggling to sort of put that together, and I've thought about it before, and I, I continue to be um, puzzled by it. The second part, though, so, so I think this is completely consistent with what Ben's talking about. I think that's an interesting line to take. I do think, and this is going to kind of go to a, you know, a little bit sharper to, to I think, where the, this paper could, could continue or, or follow on papers, is sort of thinking about the impact of age on the evolution of these firms conditional on what the firm was trying to do when it was founded. So some of you know um, this is Jorge Guzman, who's now at Columbia, who's a, a student of mine, um, and some work jointly as well as uh, a bunch of work independently by him. Um, in his thesis, he developed this way of using a, a very sort of different way of thinking about how to score startups at scale at founding, which is to look at all public, you know, business registrations. That's the full sample of all business registers. There's an, believe it or not, a very highly imperfect match between that and what's in the LBD. It's not a zero match, but, you know, it's... It's, it's not exactly tax records, it's, it's being a business registrant. Then what you notice is that, um, of course, much like the LBD, almost all new businesses are dry cleaners and plumbers. So we want to kind of like think about that, but um, the key insight is that you do different things at founding. You apply for a patent, you register in Delaware, you get a copyright, you do all sorts of things at founding. If you're trying to grow, right, around here, people name themselves, you know, Kaggle and you know, all sorts of things that are kind of unique and things like that. And then the final thing is that at the end, we know who the successes are because we can see that and, right, we know who Amazon is because they're a big firm. And so you can run a regression that says, what's the probability of success as a function of those startup characteristics against the full population of business registrants, right? Um, these, are just, these are just predictions, obviously. Um, it's a predictive analytic, but the numbers are, the amount of heterogeneity and in initial quality is enormous. So, you know, this is very consistent with recent work um, uh, by Ben Pugsley as well as others that just no matter how skewed you think the distribution of entrepreneurial quality is, it's even more skewed than that. that and I'll come back to that towards the end. It's just, you know, people who get a patent or acquire one in the first six months and register in Delaware are 20,000% more likely to have an IPO or big acquisition relative to an average person. It's just a huge number. So um, that allows you to do incredibly detailed geographic mapping. Many of you know this area. There's this kind of like what we call the wall of entrepreneurial quality right around Stanford. That's no surprise, um, right? But what Jorge did in his, um, in his job market paper two, two years ago, uh, or I guess last, last year, right? He's just there now, right? Uh, but finished last year, right? Is he looked at really the first study of moving firms. And what he looks at is this big question, right? Why doesn't everybody move to Silicon Valley? they have a good firm, right? He observes that your probability of having one of these big growth outcomes becomes much bigger if you are among a high quality firm, right? Condition on being a reasonably high quality firm, the probability of growing is enormously higher. So basically going, um, I, I, this is, Funny, I, I, the way I usually think about this number is a little bit different, but think of it as like within the highest quartile, the highest quartile of quality um, or, or highest, you know, kind of tier of quality, you go from like a 1% chance to a 6% chance. So changing that, that's changing the probability of having an IPO by 5 percentage points. That's a huge number, right? But the interesting thing is that he then goes and looks at the age of the founders separate from their firms, of all these high quality firms. And what he observes is that the, the old guys in Houston don't move. And it's all the young people who move to Silicon Valley and get this benefit. But actually, that kind of makes a little bit more sense. So the thing about it is the value of an IPO, there's from, uh, numbers from Bob Hall, the value of an IPO is about 20 million bucks to the founder. 
You're changing that probability by a million dollars, which uh, thinking about those experiments yesterday, who, who had the experiment? Yes, from the rand, right? You had this nice experiment, you get a $500,000 thing, how does it affect your life? And interestingly, a million dollars is like a lot of money, but if you're a kind of reasonably successful business person in Houston, that million dollars is not life-changing, right? Where the prospect of a million dollars when you're 23 may be completely worthwhile because you have no encumbrances. But that also affects who actually succeeds. And so I think sort of really thinking and sort of gelling his numbers around that with your, right, and sort of pushing that um, in a number of ways would be helpful. Yep, absolutely. Yep, I, I, I got my little notice here. Timer done. But now I have to do that. Okay, two, set, two more seconds. So the last question is kind of why does Silicon Valley worship at the altar of youth? And I think Ben talked about one explanation, which is that it's not a belief, it's a business model. They're just in better bargaining position with these like unencumbered young people who don't know what they're doing. And I've had many venture capitalists tell me that pretty directly. That's the, the, you know, the argument is older people will negotiate. The second, and this is just like last 30 seconds, or 15 seconds, is just the relentless logic of skewed outcomes. So, right, so Ben correctly believes the, the distribution is super skewed of impact, and the problem is, here's Gates and Jobs, the defining entrepreneurs, the literally defining entrepreneurs of one era, the defining entrepreneurs of the next era, the defining entrepreneurs of our most current era. And they're all really young. And so I would push these authors to at least take a little bit more of a challenge is why are the not highly impactful, but the most impactful inventions and companies of any era seem to be associated with the young? Thanks. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>